Okay, so um, welcome everyone. Um, today uh, marks a shift in course contents. Uh, thus far within the course, we've been covering some broader issues, motivation for use of ABMs, a glimpse at some of the things that define them, um, some uh, challenges, um, some of their major strengths, some challenges uh, that they encounter. Um, in the modeling process and some recommendations for that modeling process, both at the level of conceptualization, but also at the level of model mapping, formulation, and a little bit uh, for process during uh, maintenance of ABMs. Uh, uh, all that stuff was, was good, but um, uh, much really the heart of this class uh, lies in exploring some of the uh, design elements out of which we build ABMs, some understanding of when we use those design elements, and an understanding of the mechanics by which ABMs are supported. And uh, many of those uh, elements are part of this broader sort of alphabet soup or, or vocabulary of agent-based models. And we'll be going in successive weeks through, through representation of static characteristics of agents, uh, which I'll often term parameters that encode assumptions, uh, whether they be relational, continuous, discrete in character. Um, and we'll be talking about state of agents. We'll be talking about modes of agent-agent interaction, how agents interact with each other in an environment and how they might interact with that environment. We'll be talking about different sorts of environments, um, geographic environments, uh, uh, spatial but non-geographic environments and kind of 2D space. We'll also be talking about kind of irregularly shaped environments um, uh, such as you might have within a, within a facility. Uh, we'll be speaking about models associated with networks um, and uh, different types of networks that have distinct structures and distinct dynamics associated with them. And many other features of this that kind of make up the, the, the uh, vocabulary of agent-based models um, and provide us with this remarkable repertoire for describing phenomena in the world in a manner that allows emergent behavior to bubble up, behavior over time, behavior over space, um, behavior over networks, et cetera. Um, but today we're gonna be really make our first entree to that. And as befits that, we'll be talking about some overarching elements um, that do involve um, some of this nitty gritty elements of model design. Uh, but differ strongly between different types of agent-based models in a way that might be initially disconcerting or confusing um, to those encountering agent-based models. We'll see that there's kind of been a generational shift in how agent-based models have been designed since when I walked with younger man's shoes, first started my agent-based modeling work in the 1980s, first research work in 1990 with it, when um, how we built agent-based models was, was really very different than today. And it was associated with different uh, sort of uh, more, more restricted models of time and models of control. And we'll, we'll be exploring those two issues, which kind of are overarching issues concerning agent-based models today. Um, and we'll see that the sorts of agent-based models that we can build today exhibit much more choice. Um, um, and, and benefit from reflection about what model of time you want to use and what model of control uh, is best suited to your, to your needs. So with that preface, um, uh, I'd like to first point us to some concretes. Again, something on which we can hang our hat, something that serves as a point of reference for some of the concepts I'll be throwing out um, through the balance of the class. To that end, let's let's go and I'll I'll share my screen. Um, 
And I'd remind people that the, the slides here uh, have been posted. But before jumping into the slides, I want to, to jump into um, two models. One of them is, is one I've, I've asked you to download from the course site. It's this introductory teaching GDM version four. And if you haven't done it yet, if you haven't grabbed that from the Canvas site, it's a good time to do so. For uh, internet listeners in the future outside uh, the scope of this course, I just note that, that all these models are available in model libraries that I might make freely available. And I'm extensively asked you know, to point people to them. And, and uh, you should be able to find them uh, online. If not, write to me and I'll, I'll provide links. OK, um, but before diving into this one, I'd actually like to go in any logic to the example models area. So go help and example models. And um, I'd like you to open up um, a model that uh, I believe we've we looked at briefly in the context of some of our previous discussions. Uh, and it's this, the game of life, um, the game of life here. I noted that, um, this model um, achieved uh, a spectacular um, uh, prominence uh, within popular culture even, and certainly within uh, computer hacker culture in the 1970s. Um, it was popularized by uh, Dudney in the pages of Scientific American, uh, one of the foremost sort of lay science uh, uh, magazines at that time, and which which continues its uh, its uh, place today, um, and uh, it reflects a very powerful um, uh, insight. Uh, much of the excitement of it reflected a few simple insights about about this model. It's a model that's uh, what's called a cellular automaton. So we're going to have cells placed in a grid. And that grid completely covers partitions, that is, tessellates this space. Um, and uh, each cell within the grid, uh, if you squint, you may be able to see these little, little cells there um, uh, separated by this grid. And each of those cells um, uh, has neighbors um, that define its context. Um, and the rules. Um, of this game are such that each of these cells is either occupied, in which case we informally say it's a live cell or it's a live patch. Um, I'll, I'll use that term for it uh, because cell can by itself connote life, or it's an empty patch or informally a dead patch. Um, and um, at any one time, each of these cells is either alive or dead. And time proceeds in these steps, these time steps, and everything proceeds in lockstep. So for a given cell, whether or not it will, if we consider the current time, whether or not it will remain, it will be alive, the next time step depends on the current situation. It is a dynamical system. Its evolution over time depends on its current state. So if a cell, here is empty, that is, it's dead, and it's surrounded by exactly three neighbors, it turns live in the next time step. That we the change in state involved to the next time step for that cell. By contrast, if a cell is live right now, uh, whether or not it remains live in the next time step will depend on the number of neighbors it has. If it has exactly two or three neighbors, it will remain live in the next time step. If it has just one neighbor in this time step, it'll die. It's considered to have too little support. If it has more than three neighbors, say if it has four or five, um, it will die. And uh, cells are, are connected with their neighbors in the cardinal directions, north, south, east, and west, that is up, down, left, and right but also in the diagonals. Um, so each cell is surrounded by eight, eight other cells. So there's a maximum 
a theory of, of eight possible neighbors. So this game, this little cellular automaton, as uh, in, a, in a tradition first prominently advanced by uh, John von Neumann, the polymath scientist who contributed greatly to physics, to mathematics, to computer science, to, to uh, economics. Um, first experimented uh, extensively with these models with Stanislaw Ulam and other scientists in the 1940s. But John Conway, the British mathematician, defined this very simple set of rules that I described to you. And what's intriguing about those set of rules is that they lead to very complex behavior from what's a very simple, descriptively simple set of rules. So let's run this. Let's see some of this behavior. So if you right click on simulation, you say run here, you will see um, a description of these rules. And I'm going to I'm going to press this run button down here and you will see the system start to evolve. Um, uh, each time step is shown and then it shows the next time step, next time step, like frames of a movie. And you can see some areas of the space exhibit very regular movement. For example, these so-called stop lights here, um, which kind of blink back and, and forth um, uh, in, in succession. Um, other areas of the space are completely static. For example, this block uh, here, um, or this configuration, or this one. Yet others are evolving in rather complex ways, um, resulting, of course, from this same initial, um, the same initial state, but they're evolving over time, and some of them exhibit considerable sort of um, texture and so on. And as you play this out, you'll see um, you know, interesting patterns arrive and you, uh, arise. And you may notice high order structures. For example, this one up here is called a, a glider. And it, it sort of glides across the space and you know, goes in a certain direction. Um, others are called spaceships. And, and uh, there's, there are other names for these. And folks working with these models uh, uh, gave various names to creations of it. What's really striking about this model is how much richness, how much complexity in a technical sort where the, the whole is greater than the sum of the parts results from this model. We have extraordinarily simple models an extraordinarily you know, simple recipe and that recipe gives rise to extremely complex behavior. And in this particular model, you can click on things, um, and you know that will insert or toggle. I think perhaps a um, uh, you know an element at a, at a given whether or not a patch is live or dead, and you can trigger additional behavior. Um, for those who are interested in computer science, I'll note that. The game of life is computationally universal. That is any program in the world that can run on your smartphone or your laptop computer or on the world's most sophisticated supercomputer can be programmed in the game of life. You can actually build a computer in the game of life that will perform any calculation, which is um, an intriguing prospect. Um, uh, but it's just a, it's a, it's moreover a demonstration of the power of nonlinear dynamics, the power of, of, of uh, uh, emergence um, to create higher order complexity um, out of parts that are individually very, very simple. You see this generative feature of this, this, this complexity arising from uh, profoundly um, simple individual parts. Uh, but our main goals here are actually not to talk about uh, the philosophy of this or talk about stylized models with big aha moments like can come from this, but rather to talk about its model of time. Um, you'll notice that when I described uh, the operation of this model, and indeed, as you see up in the right hand corner, when it characterizes the steps um, for this model, it's doing so in a discrete, um, in a discrete um, um, methodology or, or discrete regime. That is, 
we're going through steps that are individually numbered as as uh, natural numbers here one zero one two three four etc and um, the entire board updates between each step it's as if everything um, in this model uh, goes through lockstep transitions where we have a current situation and i'll pause it to see that at any one time we have a current situation and then we can advance uh, that by, by one time step. And I'll open this developer panel and I'll press this here. I, I advanced it by a single time step here. The entire space updates. I advance it by uh, yet another one. Um, and uh, excuse me, I'm, I should be doing that. I thought it was advancing it by, uh, by one. I will say run for one one day here we go um one two three these are updating the entire space at once at once at a single time everything updates from its current situation to its next situation uh this is the earliest in some ways the most simple and other way uh, in other ways um, um, a more conceptually complicated way of characterizing agent time. We go in these time steps, often called ticks um, as well, time ticks um, that, are, that are triggering them. Uh, and in general, cellular automata make use of this discrete time model that we're characterizing here discrete time because we have we have time occurring in a quantized way it's time zero and then it becomes time one and then it becomes time two there's no time 1.35 or 1.78 or something like that no no we have it in 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 defined times okay um so this is one model of time it's called discrete time and uh I'm, it's not to be confused with discrete events, uh, but um, it's uh, the earliest, as I know, um, type of uh, type of model for for these uh, for these sort of uh, agent-based models. And uh, sometimes you'll hear me call it synchronous time because all these agents update at the same time, not asynchronously, not at each their own time frame. No, no, no. They all update at these time traditions. All of them compute for each patch. Am I going to be alive or dead in the next time step? According to that rule, based on the situation in the current time. Okay, so they all change change in time step, and this affects delta t. Um, for those familiar with system dynamics modeling, compartmental modeling, this may remind you of kind of Euler integration with that where you go and 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 most naively and and fix time steps in contrast to you know runga kata schemes where you you might go in in varying time steps um now uh, updating at discrete time has a lot of conceptual simplicity associated with it but it has complexity that it creates in other areas it kind of shifts complexity from one area to another um and as a at a practical matter for for modeling in more descriptively rich areas, um, uh, it commonly forces you to deal with multiple types of things that occur uh, conceptually in the same time step to kind of broker them at the time of of the time update. Um, that is, there there's there may be several types of things, you know, births, deaths you know, new cases of illness, recoveries, transmission of illness that can occur in the same time step. And there's no distinguishing which occurs first within that time step um, because there's no within the between time zero and one. It's just you are at time zero and then you're at time one. And there's been considerable um, attention and I might note considerable grief played uh, played out early on in agent-based modeling 
where people realized just how contingent their models were in, in, in terms of um, how their outcomes reflected what order you handled things. So if you handle deaths, for example, before infections, maybe some of those deaths occur of infected people, that might make a big difference to how much infection spreads. If, if, if infected people are sort of taken out of the, the consideration for infecting others, um, if they die, for a very high mortality disease, that might lead the model to, to give the impression that infection would spread a lot less because we, we remove consideration of some of the sickest people. For a disease like TB, where some of the, the people who are at greatest risk health-wise might be those who, who carry cavitary TB, you know, very, very serious pulmonary types of TB, who are also the most contagious. Um, this could really, you know, crimp our understanding. If we remove people who died before we consider who's infected with a time step of say one month, we just say, okay, first we'll deal with the deaths. Um, and we'll ignore them when it comes to they've already died, so now we'll consider infection. We're, we're going to be really limiting our, our insights. And you could say similar things for, for recovery and for reporting. You know, if you consider deaths before you count the number of people who are infected, it's going to skew your, your, your counting of, as to how many people are infected uh, at any one time. Um, by contrast, if you count the number that are infected before deaths, um, it will tend to, to lead to, you know, counting a larger number than would be there at the end of the time step. So this whole idea of going in discrete time, having just kind of um, fixed time steps, um, it's a simple idea, but it ends up having, particularly if you have coarser time steps, a fair bit of complexity within it. And you know, some types of age-based models will randomize, try to randomize after the fact within a time step, which one went first. And, and uh, one can do that, but one ends up moving towards something closer to the second model of time. And as you might've guessed, those, those listening closely, um, the second model of time is not discrete time, but continuous time. And I'd like to illustrate this too with a model. So I've asked you to open up this model called Introductory Teaching GDM version four. This is a model I made for a boot camp. Um, I think we may have built it together in a boot camp way back when, and maybe it was 2015, 2014. Um, and I'd like to walk you through it. Um, so if we, if we go to double click on person within this model we open, uh, this uh, introductory GDM version four, double click on person, and I'm gonna double click on this. Um, okay, so uh, here, let me call up person again. Okay, um, and uh, there we go. I double clicked on this to see the, the full screen here. So what we'll see is a rather, rather um, textured, sort of characterization of a person. Um, uh, a person involves, and these are characteristics of the person encoded as parameters, static characteristics over here on the left, their, their sex, their socioeconomic position, who their mother is, their birth weight in grams, their initial weight status. Um, so during childhood, the mothers count of previous births at time of birth. And then we have a set of, of um, processes characterized by these, these constructs called state charts that we're gonna be describing uh, quite a bit in coming lectures um, in which play a role in multiple modeling frameworks. Uh, Any logic is probably the first uh, to really use the widespread, but, um, but Repast has adopted them and they've achieved a fair degree of currency in agent-based modeling. And each of these state charts characterizes for a given concern, the possible states a person could be in, the, the possible actions that change those states and the rules that govern those actions. We talked about those before uh, when we glimpsed the components of agent-based model. And what you'll see here between these three state charts, one in the upper part 
here, one and, and kind of the, the middle here and one to the lower right is three different types of concerns. On the upper, you'll see um, uh, concerns related to pregnancy and whether a pregnancy is normal glycemic or dysglycemic, that is the sugar, um, blood sugar situation is out of whack or, or in balance. Um, uh, here on the, just below that is a separate state chart. Um, uh, and it characterizes whether a person is normal weight, overweight, or obese at a given time, and transitions between those. Um, and to the right here, you'll see a characterization of a person as being normal glycemic, pre-diabetic, or having type 2 diabetes, um, and the risk of, of mortality off here to the right with this kind of um, uh, uh, limit. Uh, show that. Now, um, a person is in exactly one of these simple states at a given time for each state chart. So they're in exactly one state with respect to pregnancy status, um, uh, exactly one state for, for weight, and exactly one state for this uh, diabetes state chart on the right here. Um, and you'll see the names of the state chart shown that they're, they're kind of corresponding entry points. Now, one thing to notice, though, about this is that these transitions, say, from uh, normal weight to overweight, are characterized by, um, uh, by what looks like a, it's associated with this iconography of a declining exponential curve. And if you look at it, it's associated with a, um, uh, a rate it's a hazard rate, a chance per unit time of transition. It's a chance per unit time. So it, it, its value could be anywhere zero or larger. Um, a value of two would mean on average within one half of a time unit, one, a person would transition from normal weight to overweight. But the point is that this is a hazard rate uh, involving continuous time. A person could make this transition at any time. Similarly, they could, they're at risk of dying at any time from these transitions over here to the right. And uh, for women um, uh, up here, uh, for, for those agents whose sex is female, um, uh, they can become pregnant uh, if they're, if they're non-pregnant. So here we see a characterization which is very different. It, it isn't using discrete time steps. It's using the language of continuous time stochastic processes, hazard rates, chances per unit time, and some continuous time abstraction. Um, and uh, you know, a hazard rate could be 10, in which case it will occur on average. And, one tenth of a time unit. It could be 0.1, in which case will occur on average in 10 time units. It could be any 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 value and time, um, the passage of time um, uh, will will dictate exactly when it occurs and will handle it when indeed it occurs. Um, some things do occur at fixed time points uh, for uh, relative to when this is entered, for for example, we treat uh, the baby's birth as occurring exactly nine months after um, after pregnancy, after conception. Um, but uh, of course, that's an oversimplification. So the idea here is we have a model that's a continuous time, and I'd like to run it with you. Let's go up to the baseline uh, area, and and we're gonna we're gonna run it. And one thing I didn't show you is how people are linked into networks and. We did see how they have mothers, but here we have individuals uh, placed here uh, uh, into networks, and those individuals are color coded according to some of the the conventions here. Um, so, for example, whether or not they have type two diabetes, pre diabetes, or whether they're normal glycemic. Um, they are further characterized by whether they're obese, overweight, or or normal weight. Um, and so the coloring is dictating their diabetes status. The, the uh, girth is, is dictating uh, dictated by their weight. And in fact, their weight is also evolving according to their physical activity level up here. 
Now, babies are being born. You can kind of see them with a, a, a set of diapers on, um, which, which appear uh, for brief periods of time. Um, and, uh, and, and those in the model are, some of those are becoming, some of the people are becoming pregnant in the model. And you'll see them with a little dotted line there. There's a baby that was born to that woman. Here's another baby in diapers. Um, uh, and over time, um, you know, things play out. Um, uh, people grow in girth. Uh, babies start to grow up. Um, they develop some weight status themselves. Individuals die. Others are born. You can kind of see some of the aging taking place. Um, uh, people are knit into networks. And if you scroll up a little bit, you can actually ask it to display incomes and have it display the relative income level with a... Um, uh, with sort of a size of dollar sign in different areas denoting the income level of that individual. So here's a very well healed group over on the left hand side, and here's a somewhat poor uh, group there on the left hand side. Um, and uh, if you were to really go into this, what you'd find is these transitions make use of a formulation classic in survival analysis or competing risks analysis. Um, which, which makes use of hazard rate ratios uh, multiplied by certain covariates, et cetera, to govern this transition, say, from normal weight to overweight. So this is a model um, that's formulated continuous time. We have these competing processes which play out. And you know what occurs first is a reflection of when they naturally occur. We have these hazard rates. and. If, if they go from normal weight to overweight before they go from normal glycemic to pre-diabetic, being overweight will increase their risk of going from normal glycemic to pre-diabetic. By contrast, there is some chance they will have become pre-diabetic before they go from normal weight to overweight, and that's also okay. The, the timing at which things happen is a reflection of the probabilities associated with these stochastic transitions. These chances per unit time of transitioning, say, with these, um, um, with these uh, hazard rates. Um, and there's some other events which also occur in a continuous time framework. For example, if you go up to Maine and you look at event area, you'll see, for example, reporting for histograms here. Um, there's a reporting for histograms event, which goes and fires off um, cyclically every one day here. Uh, and, you know, things, uh, if that were set to go off every hour, it would go off every hour. If it was set to go off every minute, it would go off every minute. Um, you can set time as fine-grained or as coarse-grained as you'd like. Some events may take place very quickly, perhaps um, certain types of of illness progressions or transmission in a crowd, et cetera. And other times there might be long periods of stasis between things happening. So this is a model that makes use of a different sort of model of time than that first one. This makes use not of a discrete model of time, not of a synchronous model, but an asynchronous. Yes. Great. Yeah, the networks are created based on, on family affiliation. And uh, amongst other things, they start, um, my recollection is, again, it's been many years since I built this, but my recollection is that um, they start being imposed. If you go up to Maine uh, and you go uh, down Maine, um, scroll down, you'll find that initially it's a distance-based network. So two people are connected if and only if. They lie within a distance of 75 of each other. Um, but then as, as time goes on, um, there's a growing dominance of family effects. In other words, as uh, babies are born, they are connected uh, to, their, to their mother and their mother's contacts, um, which, which are often family. Um, so if you were to look at perform birth within person, for example, what you would see is that um, the baby is connected based on the mother's connections 
uh, and and then it places the baby near the mother um, and records it being a child of that mother. Um, but um, that connects up the mother uh, to the baby and the baby to the mother's contacts as well, which are uh, which end up being mostly relatives over time. Okay, so it's based in the end. It tends to be shaped by family networks um, that that are captured by by those networks. Initially, just to sort of get the model going, it's distance based. But then distance increasingly encodes a family relationship because babies are are placed in a location near the mother. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Ah. Good. Good. Uh, the number of children that are born uh, that become uh, overused or overweight or the other use or etc. That is true. Yep. Uh, so there's endogenous, uh, the endogenous um, processes here are, are endogenous variables as dictated by those processes include um, aspects of, of pregnancy um, progression of of weight status of individuals, of glycemic status. All of these are calculated endogenously, absolutely. No, no, because the timing of pregnancy, for example, here um, is... Uh, no, no, that's also characterized like so. So going from pregnant to non-pregnant to pregnant is dictated by fertility rate. Um, from going from overweight to obese is dictated by this hazard rate, which is based on a person's characteristics, their current age, their birth weight, um, uh, but also their um, uh, th their uh, current. Um, I believe it's it's their physical activity level right here, their physical activity level right now, et cetera. So that's that's going to be an endogenously driven phenomenon. What's going to be exogenous here? What's going to be specified to the model? Remember, endogenous things the model tells us, right? There are things the model generates. It gives rise to things that are exogenous are things we tell to the model, things that we've told it to assume or, or that are specified to it in a pre-specified way. And these would include just, you know, glancing at this right here, for example, um, all these beta coefficients, all these assumptions about how does age affect this transition from overweight to obese, or how does birth weight, the, Having a having a, had a high birth weight, um, uh, you know, how does that affect your your risk of transitioning? Um, or um, how how does uh, in utero exposure to diabetes affect your risk of of transitioning or your current physical activity level? Those would be some examples of exogenous factors. There's a set of other exogenous factors at a at a higher level yet which would be associated with kind of model assumptions. So if we, if we went to, uh, well, I'm, I'll just go to, to baseline to show you, like baseline makes a certain assumption about, um, uh, about, for example, the population size here, or how quickly physical activity tends to adjust based on physical activity of my network connections. In other words, based on imitative behavior, or if, if I'm inspired, you know, you think about a social support group for exercise, it, maybe, maybe I tend to be inspired by others to change my physical activity. How quickly does that tend to occur? Um, uh, or, you know, how quickly, um, uh, or, or what's the, um, the the impact of the um, uh, of physical activity um, other than from the mother um, on on kids um, you know on their impact I think there may be also 
a mother's impact on the physical activity of kids that's also ca captured here. But these are examples of kind of exogenous assumptions that are specified to the model. Um, there are some others as well, like how far um, two people have to be from each other to influence one another. That's that network side, or what's the population density. Um, also, whether to impose SES disparities. We do impose for this model socioeconomic status disparities in the population initially. Um, and uh, and that is something which we're imposing on the model. So those are some exogenous factors. I hope that's helpful. Yeah, we'll, we'll come back to this issue of endogenous, exogenous. If we have time today, I'll do it at the end. I'm not sure if I'll have time for those models I asked you to go through. If we don't, we'll do it on Thursday as a little exercise. Okay, so two, two different models of time here, ladies and gentlemen. Let's... Um, uh, let's talk here about um, uh, the some of the some of the trade-offs here. Um, I think um, uh, I'll I'll note that um, continuous time uh, agents are updated uh, at different times according to the natural timing between events. Some events tend to fire more frequently. Um, some tend to take longer. Some hazard rates are very high, um, perhaps associated with, you know, uh, likelihood of changing physical activity level or changing uh, beliefs about risk uh, in one's area for, for a COVID infection or what have you. And, uh, uh, you know, the risks that change frequently will tend to occur, more, you know, they'll be associated with changes that occur more frequently. Some things will occur less frequently. There's no attempt to force fit it into a certain concept of that fixed. Um, here in continuous time, like we've just seen, um, in general, it's considered less likely that agents will be updated at exactly the same time. They may be updated at nearby times. Person A may get infected nearby person B at time, but it's unlikely to be at the exact time and that you have to somehow deal with that conflict, somehow deal with that, that tension about which one goes first. Um, uh, so, so here we, we typically just have each agent updating naturally at its own time and their likelihood of developing in a certain way will reflect on, um, on their current situation. So that's the continuous time model. I'd like to talk about um, some of the implications for this underneath the hood, so to speak. So the continuous time model is supported in contemporary agent-based modeling packages. It is not universal. Uh, and most agent-based packages these days support both models, continuous time and discrete time. Discrete time is kind of the older, venerable, very easy to kind of think about it. And I'll come back to that point, how it's implemented. Um, but continuous time model affords the modeler a, an ease of describing situations in the world that's quite, that's quite favorable. Um, um, so the way in which the continuous time model is supported is what's with what's called an event schedule, okay? And, and this involves some notion of time where events occur at particular points in time um, that may be spaced, spaced out significantly, you know, quite separated from one another with one occurring much after another, or maybe bunched together quite closely. So you might imagine early on, for example, maybe this is associated with a gathering or a small outbreak of transmission, whereas there might be periods of quiescence or, or, or sort of long periods between events out here um, when, when not much is going on. And, and the, in, in, in this model of time, we jump, between these events. Now, I'm going to use a term which is very widely used 
but it's oft misunderstood. And I'm going to use it in a very particular way. Um, we call a schedule like this a continuous time discrete event schedule. Now, I, I really want people here to distinguish between discrete time, which involves this kind of synchronous, simultaneous update of everyone in these fixed time points, zero, one, two, three, these quantized time points. Um, I want to I want to distinguish that from what I just said, which is a discrete event model, discrete event in continuous time. These individual bars you see here are discrete events. They are specific events that occur at a certain time. So maybe maybe this one to which I'm pointing right here, um, say this one is is representing uh, you know, the death of an individual. Maybe this one is another individual giving birth. Maybe this one is you know, an infection of an individual. Maybe this one is someone developing diabetes. Maybe this is also someone developing diabetes. These are discrete occurrences, discrete sort of um, um, you know, events or, or, or um, things which occur. And we call this a discrete event schedule because these things occur at you know, specific points in time. And in general, for a model like we've just seen, there's going to be many discrete events. Um, uh, so I, I've shown on the left-hand side, you know, some agents might go from here to here. Some might contact others. Some of these might be contact events, exposure events, where one agent contacts another. Some might be waning of immunity. Some might be death of an agent where the agent is deleted from the population. All these are, are events. Um, and what's going on behind the scenes in a model like this is that the underlying engine is running between these discrete events and taking care of the actions which occur at those discrete events. Um, so it takes care of the death that has to happen, the birth that has to happen, the exposure event, another exposure event, the infection event, the waning of immunity. Whenever they happen, it takes care of it. And this large gap between these events, it just jumps over, jumps over, jumps over. It doesn't have to simulate all this time in kind of some you know, detailed way. No, no, no. These are where things happen. This is where the state of the model changes is at these events. It is at those events that things are, are occurring. And therefore, we just jump between those events because that is when things have to change. So um, when you have a continuous time model, what's almost invariably happening is you have an event scheduler that's jumping between these events. And over long periods of time, it may you know, leap in a way that allows it to go very fast. And then at other times, it'll really get bogged down simulating a you know, large gathering where there's lots of exposure and transmission and infection occurring, et cetera. Um, now, the situation is more complicated than this. Um, uh, events sometimes have to be removed. So maybe the, there's typically pre-scheduling of events here. So for example, maybe a person comes down here, becomes infected by someone else, um, and they're in this exposed state. And it'll actually pre-calculate when they're going to complete their latency, when they're going to leave the state of latent infection and transition on to an infectious state. And it will schedule that event. So maybe they're currently at this time and it schedules this event here, but maybe before that something else happens. Maybe they die, for example, um, and they end up, um, you know, leaving via another transition. Where this occurs actually most notably is maybe there's a person who would have waned. So they come in, they recover from one infection. It pre-schedules this waning infection as going to occur, but then they get exposed uh, again, perhaps. Um, 
that's actually not a good example because they wouldn't wane, they, they would be, um, they would be immune to infection, but maybe there's another exposure which leads to them dying or something. And this will end up being descheduled. So there are many cases where events need to get descheduled. When a person dies, all future events for that person get descheduled. Um, they may be in an infectious state and they're going to be exposing others, but they, they die first. Um, or, or they end up um, here uh, being in a state where they would have died, but they get exposed first and, and they go into this exposure. So this event schedule is a highly dynamic construct. Uh, you have people um, uh, adding to these uh, events, the agents, some of, some of their events get added, some get removed when certain things occur. Uh, particularly when messages are received that kind of preempt other events um, that that push other events off. Now, all of this is hidden from the modeler. You don't have to worry about this behind the scenes, but you should recognize that this is occurring. And in fact, if you run any logic, you will see evidence if you're if you go and poke around that um, when you're running an any logic model of how many events are being handled per second. And really so much of its performance relies on its event handling. One thing that comes along with that that we'll be talking about and taking up later in this course is performance. And if you're sending a lot of events, there will be a lot of events in this, or sorry, a lot of messages. There'll be a lot of events in the schedule. Uh, if you have um, uh, what's called an event construct or one of these internal transitions that goes off frequently, that may lead to a lot of events in the schedule as well, um, which will take a lot of load on the system to, to handle. So behind the scenes, this is what's occurring for continuous time. And do be aware that it can jump from between events that are well separated to ways that can spare it a lot of time relative to, to performing all the actions um, that you might think are needed in the meantime, because nothing is occurring between those events. Eric, yeah. Uh, I'm curious, how does this work when agents are moving between places and space? Is there just like a departure and an arrival event, or is it constantly updating the position of the agent with uh, with, uh, with events? Yeah, that, that's a very good question. Um, there is a, I believe there's a pre-specified arrival event that is calculated and scheduled ahead of time. But there's clearly at a visual level, some ability that um, by which, um, and, and it's not just visually, it's logically. If other events are going off in between, that agent who is moving is at different locations at those times mm -hmm. and may, may as a result be exposed to certain things or expose other agents or interact with other resources. And um, I believe that it is basically characterizing that trajectory and their progress along that trajectory. But I think ultimately there is an event which is scheduled for when it's going to arrive. That event may be removed if the age something happens, the agent you know, dies along the way or, or ends up going in a different direction, going to, you know, changes their destination, that original event, I think, will get descheduled. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, that's my reading of the situation. Um, and I welcome, uh, you know, any, uh, any, anyone who wants to put something in, in the chat uh, about that. Okay. Um, so uh, events. Um, play uh, discrete events play a role in continuous time. That's something I wanted you to understand. Now, um, I wanna talk about um, uh, something, something else that, uh, that occurs here. I'm, so, and, and again, this was something which early agent-based modelers, more hacking together models, didn't always fully appreciate its significance scientifically. And it turns out to be very significant. You know, conceptually, uh, a lot of early agent-based models um, were um, were basically of, of the logical form that I'm showing here. 
they would go through each successive time point, and, and I'm talking discrete time here. I'm going back to discuss challenges with discrete time. Um, and these discrete time models conceptually go through each successive time point, and for each of them, I would update the space. So time step zero or tick zero, tick one, tick two, and for each of those ticks, it would update the space or update the entire all sets of agents. And you know, to to think back to the uh, to the Conway's game of life, to that first model we interacted with. Um, updating the space might consist of going through each row, going through each column, and updating the cell. There's a problem though if you if you do it this naively. So um, if you implement it in this way, in discrete time, if you were to implement a model this way, uh, where you just for each time point you update the space by going through each row and column and updating the cells according to that rule. What's, anyone see a problem with this? Yeah, Eric. The, uh, the state's change of previous agents at the same time point that'll affect the future ones. So in, in, for, for example, yeah. in the game of life, the number of active cells around any cell will change throughout that update. That's right. So the very, the update is is in a way undercutting it's changing the information on which other cells updates occur. So for a given cell, updating that cell um, will, will change the situation for the next cell to be updated in terms of what it sees as its neighbors. And so no longer is it the case that all cells are kind of updating conceptually at the same time. Instead, you have this kind of serialization of updates. It's certain cells are privilege because they go first in a way. Um, they're not affected by, you know, the very first cell to be updated is not, it's not, has not seen, uh, not had any, lost any of its information about the current state. The next cell, you know, its current situation may be affected by that first cell's update already. It's lost the information on what the current state was before that, that cell updated. Um, so, it leads this artificial dependency between cells. You know, we we conceptually like to just say, okay, all cells update based on the current state. They figure out their next state, and then they update to that. Um, but if if it's implemented naively, um, there's this ordering between this. If I update cell A first, cell B. Cell B has lost the information needed to do its update um, about what was the case. And similarly, if I do B first, A loses it. And so um, this, this caused in early circles, you know, considerable consternation. So one of the things that came out is that these models effects were very different if you didn't account for this. That if you just treated this like um, an art of uh, kind of a, an accident or a minor matter, you would get very different results than in fact, if you were careful about it. So, uh, so with discrete time, uh, there were two, you know, two major approaches that I'm gonna be mention for handling this. One is called double buffering. Um, basically you, you toggle between two representations of the current state. So at any given time, you retain the current state and what you're updating is, is not the current situation. You're updating kind of what the next situation will be. And then you switch to that next situation um, as the current one. And uh, as that is, things are updating at that, you, you're not updating the current situation, you're updating the next one, yeah. Um, so you alternate between these two sort of representations. Um, one that is kind of the current situation, the other is the next, and then next time you, you switch it around and, and, and uh, you update that situation um, into, uh, and, and, and you alternate between them. The other possibility is you go through all agents, you figure out what their updates will be without performing their updates, you get 
get them all the information they need to do their job to figure out what they're going to do, but you don't actually do it. You figure out their delta, their change they're gonna undertake. And then you go through and you say, perform this. This is very reminiscent of, of things called two-phase commit protocols in computer science, um, which are very widely used in databases, for example, in the context of transactionality for those from computer science background. Um, but you'll see both of these. Um, the, the double buffering one is, is shown here. I mean, the, the basic idea is you have even cells and you have odd cells. And you know, if time is even, you're going to be uh, updating, um, you're gonna be reading from odd cells and, and updating even cell into even cells. And then um, during the other time step, the, the odd time steps, you're going to do the reverse. You're going to be reading things from even cells and updating into odd cells. Um, so you kind of go back and forth between these two um, on a given time step. One represents your current situation and one represents your next situation. So for this first one, this is our current situation. Uh, what you're reading from, that's our current state and this becomes our next state. Um, on other time steps, the alternating time steps, this is our current time, uh, this is our current state, and this is our next state that we're updating. Never do we update the current state out from under us. Never do we change what's going on around us um, on which other cells depend. So this is a very common model. When I first started doing my my uh, uh, my research based agent based modeling. This was a dominant model. We actually had computer hardware, which would do it, um, built custom for uh, cellular automata. Um, okay, um, to, to take a look at um, this other model, I'll, I'll just go to the game of life here. And um, you, you folks could follow along in the game of life. I'm gonna show it with slides since I have slides to, to illustrate it. Um, but you can you can follow what I'm doing in there. Um, so um, right. So in the game of life under main, you will find this this thing to turn on enable steps. This actually enables synchronous time, discrete time, and it basically says, "Tell me when a step is going to occur." And steps occur. At, at duration 1.0, you can see it just below the red the red arrow up there, um, uh, and that that enables within any logic this kind of discrete uh, time component. So it's under main and and uh, uh, here under uh, the general uh, general page, I believe. Um, okay, and and when you do that. Um, this is making use of this model that I mentioned uh, in the slides here, um, the separate passes. So the idea is you, you have an on before step, which basically goes gathers information um, to figure out what agents are going to do. And then on step undertakes that action. Um, and I'm not going to dwell on this because I do want to get to my slides on the other topic. But um, here, um, agents, uh, basically, you're going to gather their information. And I, I thought I had a slide showing this, but uh, I will will do this. So here we have, whoop. oh, no. Um, oh, look at that. Any logic died. OK, well, I think that's something. Um, OK. Um, So, um, uh, sure, um, okay. Oh gosh, okay. Okay, so when we have these models that are updating in discrete time with this kind of gather and then commit model, um, uh, you have this separation of on before step where information is gathered. And then, um, sorry, it's this one here. 
and then uh, on step, we'll actually under, undertake the actual action. Um, so um, we gather information on, on before step. So we'll we'll go go here and each agent here in okay now it's closed so back to example models okay okay and there we go okay okay so if we go to um we go here to um excuse me to to main here um uh we'll see within main uh this enable steps and uh and in the step duration will be 1.0 if we go to if we go to cell here um now we can look at uh for each cell uh the agent actions and uh, the agent actions are up here. Um, and uh, basically we figured out ahead of time what our neighbors are. And then uh, for each time step, before it occurs, there's kind of two passes. One where beforehand we figure out the number of neighbors around us that are alive. So that figures out from the current situation, how many neighbors of ours are living? Are occupied um, because remember that will determine whether or not we stay living. If we're currently empty and there's exactly three neighbors that we have that are live, we become live. Um, if uh, we're currently living and there are two or three neighbors that we have that are live, we stay live. Otherwise, we're not live. So the key factor for all of those is how many neighbors around us in the current situation are live. And that's why it's going through in this before step, it's figuring out everything it needs to know about our situation. And then, and then on the on step, it actually turns that into action. It actually accordingly updates this agent's situation uh here and so it it sets this whether or not they're alive this is an aspect of discrete time modeling so big picture i want to leave you for for this lecture with a couple of key understandings Traditionally, agent-based models made use of a discrete time model. Um, it was recognized uh, at, at some important point that in order to give scientifically valid results, that discrete time model really needs to be done in a synchronous fashion that you don't have sort of updates halfway through for some agents, you would instead have all agents updating conceptually in lockstep at the same time, based on the current situation of the model, update to the next situation. And it turns out implementing that requires more mechanisms. So it's a little bit complex. Discrete time is conceptually very simple, but realizing it takes extra work. You're either doing this pre-gathering stuff we saw in any logic just there, or you're doing this double buffering stuff where you have an even state and an odd state, and you go from one being the current one and the other the next to vice versa, and you go back and forth. It's extra work. And finally, the other complication you have with discrete, discrete steps is you get many types of things that are in competition, competing risks, as we'd say, in the statistical area, which are which are vying for occurring um, during this period of time. And you know, when you're only updating once a month, let's say, you've got to figure out did the deaths, was this person infected before they died? And you know, do I discount all deaths first, take care of deaths first, and then count the number of infectives or count the number of infectives ignoring the deaths and then consider deaths? It's um, 
it's kind of messy because you start thinking what is going on in that interval, which is what you want to, which is the whole idea of discrete time to not have to worry about that. So discrete time is conceptually a nice model, but it's practical realizations tend to be complex. Um, and partly for that reason, continuous time abstractions have, have become much more popular. Um, uh, this idea that agents can update at any time, no matter how fast or how, how infrequently they update, it'll take care of it. And the way that's captured is outside the view of the modeler. Discrete time kind of forces it to be in the modeler's face to have to deal with that. Continuous time is handled by the environment. It's handled by, in this case, repast or any logic or, or you know, net logo or what have you. Continuous time allows a more natural model of, of occurrences. Um, uh, it, if things occur at natural times, but it does require more mechanism in terms of an event schedule. And uh, a continuous time abstraction um, is the main one we'll tend to use in this course. Um, uh, it is one which you'll find quite well supported in many packages um, and uh, tends to be um, less complicated to understand for, uh, for sophisticated models, um, less, less uh, tricky. Discrete time does have some additional things I'm not emphasizing, some additional advantages. And one of them is the potential for parallelization of things that are going on between discrete time points and within a discrete time point. And I won't talk about that here, but those who are computer science backgrounds should know that um, discrete time does have parallel update opportunities associated with it. Um, uh, we, we have the potential, for example, for updating all cells in parallel on a GPU with, with different special processing units um, uh, at the same time, because um, they're just figuring out the information they need to do the job on the one hand, or they're performing the change without needing to collect information on the other. And those can all be done in parallel. There's some other opportunities also within a time step, but I won't go into that here. So those are two models of time, okay? Um, I wanna now transition to a related topic that I just wanna hit on quickly, but it's an important one that's also marked a generational shift in agent-based modeling. Um, Traditionally, I had noted that a lot of agent-based models look kind of like this, naively. I said over a sub-period of time, for each successive time point in turn, update the current situation in the model. And here I'm not going to get as much into uh, the mechanics of, of how they're updating, but the the point is that this is a very top-down model. We're saying for each time point here, update the space. And for the space, go through each row, go through each column and update that patch, for example. Or you can imagine this instead being for each successive time point, go through each agent and update that agent, for example. Um, now, um, this is a model which gave sort of top-down control of models. And a lot of agent-based modelers liked it because it was very um, uh, it was very transparent what was happening. Basically, I'm updating the space, and as part of the space, I go through each agent and I update the agent. And it was conceptually clear the mechanics of how it was implemented. But it turns out that it got very complex to implement sophisticated agent-based models, very, very um, involved once the models became quite sophisticated. And newer generations of agent-based models have made use of what we could, we might refer to as frameworks, drawing on a, an area that, or, or a term that's widely used and, and 
the software development and computer science area. Um, and the idea here is these are these are frameworks. Some of them are open source. Some, like any logic, are proprietary. Um, uh, they rather than you writing this model from scratch and describing it in kind of this top-down way, they provide this overarching framework that calls off to your code. So rather than you writing all the infrastructure, they provide these engines that essentially wrap your code up and call it at the right time. This is true for Repast. It's true for NetLogo. It's true for any logic. Uh, in ways that it really wasn't 20 years ago, 30 years ago with agent-based models. Um, and this is sometimes referred to as the Hollywood principle. Um, don't call us, we'll call you. Um, so, you know, we'll call you when it's your job to do something. And in order to understand how to build up any logic models, in order to understand how models in repast work, uh, you need to understand something about this principle because it's going on behind the, behind the scenes. Um, and what you will find is throughout models, um, and we'll, we'll use any logic to, to illustrate this, there are, the models are littered with places where your code, you put code or otherwise logic to be invoked. And the framework, the surrounding framework, in this case, any logic will take care of invoking them at the right time. We just saw this for the game of life, where we have on before step and on step, these things that are invoked at certain times on startup is another example. But let's go to that introductory teaching GDM, which we saw earlier. And we will see this in spades. So if we start to explore this, we double click on person and so on, you will end up seeing lots and lots of examples where this is occurring. Uh, an example would be, you know, at this place here, going from a pregnant state to non-pregnant, a birth is performed. Um, so we perform birth um, uh, here. When a person, uh, develops this glycemia. Um, uh, if you click on this uh, this link here, develop this glycemia. There's some actions that occur. Uh, even this very calculation of what's the risk of developing this glycemia, developing gestational diabetes. This is dependent on a hazard rate of a formula for the hazard rate, which calls off to, for example, the current age of the person or it gets the current physical activity level of that person in ways that, you know, when this gets invoked, when it needs to figure out what this rate is, it will, it will run this code. When this fires, when this transition occurs, it will increase the, it will basically increment. It'll say, oh, there's one more, it will tally up one more case of gestational diabetes cumulative cases and current cases. Um, uh, moreover, um, same thing occurring for, for overweight um, here. For example, uh, when people become overweight, it, it, it re refers them, okay, um, uh, what's the current time at which they have become overweight so we can keep track of how long they were overweight? Oops, sorry, uh, for how many, how many months or years? Um, because that in some of our work and work of others has been shown to reflect on the risk of diabetes, um, the sort of exposure to overweight or duration of overweight um, uh, tends, to, tends to lead over time to risk of diabetes. Um, so throughout this model are little snippets of, of sort of code that, that occur at certain times. Um, sometimes these codes are to calculate values. Sometimes this code is to engage in bookkeeping um, or to change certain risks. So when become, someone becomes overweight, their mortality rate, for example, uh, becomes higher. Um, 
when they die, um, uh, there's a record of um, uh, that that is updated, reflecting, for example, how many how many uh, uh, cumulative person years with diabetes did this person accrue. So some of this is bookkeeping. Some of it is is actions that need to occur, like undertaking the removal of this person from the population, but. When we look at a model in a contemporary agent-based framework, um, what we will see is something that looks very different from this sort of top-down model that people used to put in, um, used, to, used to write for implementing an agent-based model where everything is planned out from the top and I write code that undertakes all the actions and it's all right in front of me. Instead, the model logic is spread through many pieces, many different areas of the model, which get invoked at different times. Um, uh, if, if, you know, if I were to explore this even more, I would put point, for example, to some of these events, which are firing off at certain times and, and updating data, for example, um, in the model um, that are that are updating histograms, there's a lot of actions that are occurring as this model runs, and the choreography of them, which is executed at what time, under what circumstances, um, uh, is or or under what precise circumstances is it occurring at what times so I should say is it occurring? This is specified by the model. Uh, by the by the framework rather. What is specified is things like how frequently this will be occurring, what's the risk of this occurring, the hazard rate, you know, um, how long from now it should be before after conception until a birth takes place, for example, here is set to be nine months. But then, you know, what's actually occurring when um, uh, when this fires off, that, that will trigger my performed birth. So in modern agent-based modeling, in contrast to early agent-based modeling, there's no top-down structure that the agent-based modeler writes. Rather, they are putting together these different components that are, that are uh, integrated in ways that they will be called by the framework at the appropriate time. You know, when someone becomes obese, this code will be called. When this transition or, or this transition is fired, um, uh, we, will, we will have uh, them come into this state and this code will be called. So the art of agent-based modeling now is kind of a decentralized art. Um, there's logic woven throughout a model and often, unfortunately, the linkages between different areas of this model are not fully, um, fully evident when you first look at the model. Uh, when you first look at the model, it may not be obvious, for example, how mortality risk over here to the right depends on a person's weight. But it does, as indicated by, by, this, um, by this variable. Um, it may not be obvious how glycemic status, so someone's progression among stages of diabetes, depends on their current weight. Um, but that is that is something which is characterized here based on uh, whether or not they're obese and whether or not they're overweight. So modern nature-based modeling has um, a somewhat unsettling aspect to it for someone encountering these models that there's no there there. It's, it's hard to put your finger on where the logic is. You can't in a single, in a single glance see you know, the full span of the logic like one could in, a, in early agent-based modeling where the, you know, it would be placed in code in, in front of one. Instead, there's lots of bits of logic placed around to be invoked at the right times. And a lot of the art of agent-based modeling is knowing how to build up these design components to capture 
um, those processes that one wants to, to capture and how to weave in the logic that given a representation of those processes will, will, will capture information that needs to be captured along the way. And one does it by weaving them into a description of these processes, such with these, such as with these state charts, or such as with these events over here to the right. So agent-based modeling is kind of a decentralized um, type of modeling now within these frameworks. Uh, rather than writing an overall top-down structure, you instead build up these pieces that whose choreography. Uh, is is managed by the underlying framework. Um, true in repast, true in in any logic, uh, and and true in a in a large number of these frameworks where the framework will will call off to your components. So those are the two big um, two big sort of areas of learning for today. Models of time, discrete time, continuous time and models of control of, of agent-based models with a shift from a top-down level of control to kind of a more bottom-up framework choreographed method of control. And where the latter type of mode of control tends to be a better fit, particularly for continuous time characterization, where things could go off at any time and you can't just write your sort of top-down characterization, do this, now do that, now do that, now do that. You're more waiting for something to happen. Um, it's kind of um, much of the flavor of, of, of continuous time modeling lies in this sort of framework-based choreography. Okay, so um, those are two overarching, um, uh, overarching, um, spheres that we need to understand for agent-based modeling. Next time, we're going to be jumping into um, some more mechanics um, of designing of these models. And we're going to be talking about one of the foremost motivations for agent-based modeling, the ability to capture heterogeneity in agents, the ability to represent agents which are heterogeneous in discrete attributes, in continuous attributes, and in relational attributes. Um, those words may seem minor, but they have profound significance. And when we compare them to a compartmental model, they can seem rather astounding. In a compartmental model, we can capture through disaggregating stocks, male and female stocks, for example, discrete heterogeneity. We can stratify our model by age categories, zero to four, five through nine, 10 through 14, et cetera. But we can't really capture in an ordinary differential equation model, a stock and flow model, a compartmental model, use whatever terms from it you want. We cannot capture continuous heterogeneity, continuous age, continuous income, continuous aspects of, of, of someone's uh, education level or, or exposure to pack years of smoking or exposure years of obesity. And um, it's rather freeing to be able to do that in an agent-based model, but relational heterogeneity is arguably just as important. The ability to capture the fact that, you know, I have these family relationships or, I have this relationship with um, uh, with with a physician or with a service dog. Um, capturing that sort of heterogeneity opens up a lot of opportunities for capturing the effects of context. So next time, that's where we're going to be jumping into heterogeneity, capturing heterogeneity models, and why it's so much more scalable with respect to heterogeneity. Um, incomparably more scalable compared to compartmental modeling. We'll see that the very different architecture of agent-based models means that we can represent heterogeneity um, with uh, tremendously more uh, flexibility and scalability 
uh, more nimbly at, and more efficiently than we can in a compartmental model. Okay, so that's where we're going next time. And um, I look forward to engaging with you about that. Next time, we'll also be talking about um, that exercise I asked you to go through for today. So um, come prepared to, to volunteer some ideas for um, exogenous, endogenous, and ignored components um, for those two models. Thanks very much. And I'll turn now to office hours.